Well, good morning. Good morning. Oh, I'm so excited to be here this morning. My name is Chase. Uh, for those that don't, don't know who I am, my wife Holly and I are uh, here at part, some of the pastors here at Living Water, and uh, we have, it's just been a while since I've been to, at this campus, and so it's so good to see your face this morning. So good to be here on 4th of July, on Independence Sunday, Sun, Independence Day on a Sunday. Uh, God's got a word for us today. Uh, I'm going to have you, if you have a Bible with you this morning, would you turn to the book of Matthew chapter 5? We'll be camping out in verses 27 through 30 here in just a minute. Matthew chapter 5, 27 through 30. Uh, yeah, happy 4th of July. I love this country. Thankful for the freedom that we have. Thankful for the people that have paid for it. Uh, it's a great nation to live in. We've come a long way. We've still got a long way to go, but what a great place to be, uh, to be alive, to be living. This is a a great, a great day to celebrate. Super thankful for Pastor John and Fawn for the opportunity to preach this morning. Uh, I love them. If you don't know them and you're maybe newer around here, uh, they are two of some of the finest men and women, just period, men and women, uh, but also leaders that I've ever been around in my life. And uh, it's an honor to be on the team with them. God has them here, called them here, and is moving mightily through their lives and their, their, their ministry. I'm thankful to get to be a part of it. And I'll tell you what, I think I said this last time I had the opportunity to preach, but uh, this has been a really difficult season to pastor the last 18 months or so. Um, but th those two people are the real deal. Like you don't get, you don't get something on the platform that you don't get out, outside of the platform or behind, behind the doors. They are the same people that love Jesus and love you up here as they are off there. And I've watched them over this last season endure and deepen their, their love and trust in Jesus. Uh, and it's been it's been it's been admirable, respectable, and inspiring for me. But I really really love them, and uh, love being a part of their team. So, this last week, my family moved to the city of Lacey. Yeah, it was a crazy week. I don't know how many of you. I mean, if you've experienced moving before, something about moving. Uh, it's just you're not going to be moving in heaven. Let's just say that. You know what I mean? Like, there's just not. There's not going to be that, that, that situation there. Uh, it's terrible. Like, there's nothing awesome about it at all. It's, it's physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, relationally just draining. And, uh, and then we have three little ones, five, three, and one, Wes and Bo and Delaney. Just that process, just kind of thrown in there, just mixes it all up and makes it all even more delightful. But um, <laughs> we moved to Lacey, and we... Uh, we moved to Lacey because God called us to Lacey. If you haven't heard, uh, we are launching a Living Water Lacey campus in September. Yeah. Super excited about that. My wife and I are going to go, and there's, a, there's an existing church that, is, uh, that has been, their pastor's retired and, um, over earlier this, this, earlier this year, and we're coming together with them, and we are officially launching September 12th, Living Water Lacey Campus, and I'll tell you what, to be able to partner with what God's doing through Living Water, uh, we have our Yelm Campus, we have our Korean congregation that meets on Sunday afternoons across the parking lot, and now a location in Lacey. Um, we're just really excited about what God is doing. And so I wanted to, to encourage you. We've had uh, several people reach out and say, hey, tell us more. Um, we either live up there and, man, it'd be great to have a location maybe closer to us, or God's stirring something in you and you feel like, man, I want to go be a part of what God might be doing in, in Lacey, a part of the Living Water family. And, uh, and so I want to I wanna just in two, two important ways you can get more info about that if you're thinking about that. Pray for us for sure. We really need that over the next couple months as we uh, gather our launch team. But if you're interested, you can go to livingwater.com slash Lacey and uh, get, get a bunch of information there. We actually have our first interest meeting on Sunday night, next Sunday night, July 11th at 630 at the campus that we'll be, uh, we'll be launching. So if you want any info on that, again, livingwater.com slash Lacey, you can get more information about that. Um, and then one last little plug, because it's all fresh and it's all new, and we need all the help we can get. Instagram. We're on Instagram. If you want to follow us on Instagram, uh, at LWLacy, give us a follow just to stay up to date with what God is doing, Living Water Lacy Campus. Here we go. We're continuing a series going through the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, this, the, the text that we're, we're at today was not was one that was a part of the, the schedule for our series. Um, and it's one of those ones where 
you know, it, it'd be a lot easier just to kind of like skip over it and go to the, the next couple paragraphs maybe and find some ones that just would be a little bit more, um, I don't know, just less awkward uh, to talk about. But I'll tell you what, uh, it's in God's word. That's part of why we're talking about it. Um, the avoidance of teaching scripture is just as bad as the abuse of teaching. Or, or it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a problem, I think, in some places where people avoid what scripture says. We're not doing that today. Um, and beyond that, God is, God is not rolling around in accidents. Like, he knows, he knows exactly he um, needs to hear this message. And I believe he's, he, if you're here, there's something he wants to speak to you through his word today. And uh, so we're going to we're gonna, we're gonna open it up. We're going to read it together. We're going to break it down. We're going to have an encounter with God this morning. And, uh, and I really believe walk out of here being transformed by Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 5. The Sermon on the Mount. We are going to be in verse 27, and I'm going to read through verse 30. It'll be up on the screens as well if you do not have a Bible with you this morning. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Happy Fourth of July. (laughs) Um, We're going to dive into this today. And uh, I, I do want to give some like kind of pre- pretext here. If you've got younger younger ones in the room that you may not want to have a follow up conversation about some things, um, uh, have prepare to have follow up conversations. <laughs> um, but no, I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best to walk through this. I, I mean, I, I feel like this this kind of topic and this kind of situation, we're talking about lust, but more than lust, we're talking about our hearts. So so don't tune out because you might go, oh, I'm not. This isn't connected to me. I, I don't experience this stuff. I haven't. I, this is not an issue I struggle with or any of that. So this isn't, I'll just get through this and then get ready to barbecue. God's, this is not just about lust. This is not just about adultery. This is about our hearts. And Jesus wants more access to transform our hearts this morning. So wherever you land, whether you're, you're in it today, you're struggling with something, you're wrestling something, or you have struggled or wrestled, uh, God wants to do something in your heart today. And, uh, and I believe that he's going to. Right out of the gate, Jesus addresses a you've heard it said. He's, he's gone into this list through, uh, through chapter 5 where he talks. He just kind of goes and rattles a bunch of things off where he's saying, you've heard it said, but I say. And I want to I talk about this for a second because I think that uh, if, we're, if we're not careful, we could skip right over it and go right into the, the meat of what he's saying. But, but he says, you've heard it said. And, and then but he says, but I say. He contrasts this idea he knows the, the group of people he's talking about. Uh, he's talking to his disciples, and then as he, as he was continuing to talk, uh, preach this message, more people were gathering. By the end of it, we see that there was crowds of people. So he's addressing both those that are close to him, following him, and those that are you know, observing and trying to figure out what's going on. He knows his audience, and he's, he's, he knows that they know the law. He knows that they know right from wrong. He knows that a lot of them have it memorized. He knows that a lot of them have had it in, in, you know, embedded in their DNA. And so he's contrasting this moment. He, he says, you've heard it said, because he knows he's heard, they've heard it said. And then he's about to drop an extra degree of, of, of content on them. You, you've heard the law. You know how to follow the rules. You know what's right and what's wrong. But I'm after something even more important than rule following. And there's a lot of us here today, I think, in our relationships with Jesus that we might be in this boat where we've become, we've become, we've become so used to and familiar to what, what we've heard it was said, whether it was scripture, whether it was how we were raised in church, whether it was the way we do things. We've become so, uh, uh, so connected to that, but, but yet absent from what Jesus is saying in this moment for you in your life. You, you've, you've justified, I've, I've, I know the Bible. I've been to church. I've been doing this thing for a long time. But, but the fresh word of what Jesus is saying, we've become maybe a little bit too now to. So he's calling people back to, you've heard it said, but I say. I think a lot of us could be in that boat today. We would be in the group of people 
maybe that Jesus is acknowledging here in this text. Been following God for a long time and connected to what we've heard, but, but maybe, maybe missing that we're capturing Jesus' heart for our lives and embodying his words. So in this text, Jesus, right out of the gate, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus contrasts the obvious physical behavior that nobody would ever be able to second guess committing adultery. He contrasts that with the private heart condition, looking with lustful intent. And he's contrasting them both, connecting them together. See, committing adultery was like that far and extreme on the spectrum. And if you're in here today and you have committed adultery or you're walking in some uh, kind of adulterous relationship or you haven't been faithful, uh, let me say this. God's grace abounds. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. There's no shame when it comes to the Father for you. God's got, if you're currently in something, God's got something he wants to do in you. If you've been holding on to something, and you're, you've been walking around condemned and ashamed, uh, let me tell you, there's more freedom for you today to experience in Christ Jesus. Amen. Committing adultery was that far and extreme, though, on the end of the spectrum. It would have been really obvious and very public to the people in that time in regards to, like, what was black and white. It was extremely black and white. It wasn't this gray area where you're like, did he? Did she? It was clear. Like, it was not a matter of, like, it was known, and that was very obvious to people. Super tangible. And people felt like they could justify a lot as long as it didn't swing to the end of the spectrum of committing adultery. It's like that was the obvious thing. So like, man, and that was clear. So, so they were beginning to be, grow in people's hearts this like, well, how, much, how much like lukewarm, how much like gray can I exist in without committing adultery, which is against the law, which is against the rules. Like that's clear. I've heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. So that's what I gotta, that's what I gotta stay away from. But like how close can we get to that without like losing this whole God thing in our life? And people had begun to justify a lot. And Jesus comes in, shows up to the scene, and he just demolishes that thought process. He just crushes it. And he challenges our human proclivity to try and push the boundaries of our flesh as far as they can go while still trying to remain acceptable and tolerable to like what God can accept and do. I, there's something about this. I, as Christians, it's our, it's our proclivity. It's our propensity to want to go like, how do I keep as much flesh in my life and in my daily you know, habits and behavior as I can while like still like being Christian. And Jesus shows up and he's like, yo, it's so much more than that. It's so much more than just that, that physical behavior and you know, knowing you're out of that category. See, some of us have become really good friends with our flesh. Like best friends, BFFs. We've adjusted our convictions to standards that feel better for us. And we'd have this justification conversation in our minds all the time about, well, I mean, it's not adultery. So we've traded in conviction by the Spirit for justified comfort and flesh. Here's the problem with that. It doesn't glorify God. Here's the problem with that. God does not get glory. It breaks his heart. It's not his plan for our lives. It's not what, it's not what we were made for. It, 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 it's not good. It doesn't help us. And ultimately, it hurts us and those that we love. The longer you live in that justification conversation. Now, listen, this whole, this whole message today, you could, you could put lust and then any other category that has to do with our flesh. So that, that's where I want you to go. It's, this is about your heart, my heart, our heart today. But, but the longer we go justifying, the more damaging it becomes to you and those that you love around you. Because that's not how God has created us. It's not how he's made us. It's not what he's called us to walk in. Let's talk about lust for a moment. Statistically, uh, it, when it comes to lust and pornography and all that stuff, it off the charts. I'm not even going to go through all the, the stats today about what 
you know, the, the, the viewership and consumer, consumerism statistics when it comes to pornography in the United States and, and around the globe because it would just, we would walk out of here like depressed, beyond depressed. But statistically, a lot of us in this place have or are struggling with that space, men and women, like at astronomical levels. And I'll tell you what, the pandemic hadn't helped any of that because it was a different degree of coping with things that were out of our control. I had conversations with men and women when it came to online church that was, was with men, I didn't have conversations with men, so it was so difficult for people to have uh, online church because they'd be watching service on their iPad or on their phone and part of them would have this confliction because they're sitting there trying to watch this service and like worship and they're like, I was the same device that I was using to, to lust and you know, commit a degree of sin and so how can, I, how can I justify this? And it was difficult for people. Then that's the reality still. It's, 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 it's insane. Now, and it's super taboo to talk about in the church and in a lot of Christian circles. It's not as taboo out, out in the world anymore. It's pretty normalized. It's pretty um, expected when it comes to the people, uh, the conversations that people outside of following Jesus are having those conversations. Let me say this today. We have got to take the taboo and stigma away in the church from this issue. We have to. We, I, listen, I understand that there's a lot of us in here upbringing and raised in a different generation where like this stuff was, you, you don't talk about this stuff, it's all dirty, you don't, we don't even go there, everybody just private, keep it away, and we don't discuss whatever, but the problem is, uh, the, the more we do that, the, the longer it's going to take to get healthy. The more we create a space in a church environment where people walk in feeling like there's something wrong with them and they're dirty and they can't be in here until they're clean and put together, the longer it's going to take for people to get healing through Christ Jesus in the church. I'm telling you, we've got to find a way to take this stigma and taboo around lust and all of this issues with pornography that a lot of men and women have and do struggle with away from our Christian circles because God has got some work to do and this has got to be a space and an environment that's healthy and safe to do that. I'm not talking about normalizing, accepting, or minimalizing the sin, but we have to change the way we talk about it and ask God to help us with the willingness to normalize talking about it. So many men and women are living bound still because of the fear of what will happen if they're real and honest about their struggle. I know some of you are sitting here today and you're, you're gonna be thinking to yourself the whole message, will, will, I, will I actually do anything about this after this day's over, after this message is over? Because you're calculating the cost. You're calculating what, what it'll take for you to have an honest conversation with somebody that you need to have a conversation with. And, 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 and then you'll, you'll do it for a hot second You'll think about it, and you go, no, I don't want to do that because that'll hurt. That'll co- that, could, that could cost me a lot. So I'm going to keep trying to handle my issue by myself. And let me tell you, you will keep struggling by yourself. You'll keep staying bound by yourself. And the enemy loves to, to make us believe we can overcome something on our own. No. So many, so many men and women are living bound because of the fear of what will happen if they are real and honest. So you keep fighting alone. You keep trying to convince yourself you, you have the strength and the self-control to stop and overcome, but you don't. And I don't mean that in a way to speak death or discouragement over you, but, but you don't. And I'm telling you, some people just need to hear the, the, the truth today that you believed a lie, that you can do this on your own, in your own private space. And then and you keep doing that, you're going to stay bound. I'm telling you, why, why are we doing this today? It wasn't just because it was on the schedule. There's freedom in Christ Jesus that he has for some people to experience that they haven't experienced yet. And, and it's not just for newer believers. It's for, it's for some of you in here that have been following Jesus for years, but you've become numb to your degree of sin because you can manage it. And I'm telling you, we think we are great sin managers. We aren't. Sin will manage you. And, and today's an opportunity for you, follower of Jesus, former leaders in churches, you know, whatever you want to put yourself in a body, this is a day for you to have a, a, a new, new degree of freedom in Christ Jesus. I believe it with all my heart. You can't fight this thing alone. The reality is we weren't meant to live this life alone, and we need others to help us walk out the life of freedom in Christ that he died for us to have and make accessible to us. Now, let me tell you this. Freedom, Independence Day, Beautiful day to celebrate. Thank you for this country's freedom that we have to live 
in America, when it comes to our spiritual lives, freedom is possible. Freedom is possible. I mean, it, we sing about it. We declare it. It's catchy, victorious, all that stuff. But a lot of the times, we actually don't believe freedom is possible in our own lives. We, we have a, we have a, because we, a lot of us haven't experienced it. We had it for a moment, but then we fall back into something or we cycle back through. Freedom is possible. Actual freedom in your personal life, in your marriage, in your family. Stop believing the lie that the enemy has been telling you that you've messed up too much or that you're in too deep, or that you've lied too long. No, with Jesus, freedom is possible. And it's not just possible for a moment. It's possible to live in. And I believe that's what he wants us to do. So today, Jesus wants to deal with our lust, forgive us, free us, and transform our hearts. Again, if you're sitting here today and you're like, lust is not an issue for me. Uh, wherever your flesh is weak, wherever your flesh is struggling the most, insert that into what I'm about to walk through, into what I'm saying. That Jesus wants to deal with your fill in the blank, forgive you, free you, and transform your heart. Because at the end of the day, this whole Sermon on the Mount thing, it is about the kingdom of God principle of how we really walk in a healthy and abundant and flourishing life, but it's about our heart. Jesus contrasts that. He's, he, he shows us over and over and over again. He cares so much more about what's going on in our heart because we, we could put the outside on, we can change behavior, but behavior modification does not always equal heart transformation. Jesus wants to do some heart transformation today. Okay, so how do we get there? How do I actually have that moment with Jesus or have that moment again? Because some of us have had that moment before. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of break it down into two sections today. First section is, like, how do, we, how do we get free? Like, how do we get free from wherever we are finding ourselves wrestling or struggling with today? And then the second section is going to be, how do we stay free? Again, there's going to be parallels for multiple different categories. But we do want to address what Jesus addresses here in Matthew chapter 5 with lust. How do we get free? Here's the ingredients, I believe, for a fresh encounter with Jesus for getting free, because that's where it all starts and it all begins. Um, there's a lot of great things and options out there, but if you are trying to do it without Jesus, if you're trying to do it without a fresh encounter with Jesus, it's really, really difficult, darn near impossible. And let me, let me say this. I think a lot of us in general just need fresh encounters with Jesus. I think some of us are operating off of like uh, an encounter with Jesus from a marriage conference three or four years ago or a summer camp a couple years ago. Or, and I'm telling you, like, God has some fresh encounters in store for you. I mean, you have a fresh encounter with Jesus, everything changes. Your, your perspective, your outlook, your family, your future, we need fresh encounters with Jesus. So what's the ingredients for a fresh encounter with Jesus? Real simply, number one, be real. Be real. Be real with where you are in this moment. So many of us try to pretend like, we even try to convince ourselves that we are healthier than we are. And so it creates this facade between like what we hope and believe that, our, I mean, God sees it all. God knows it all. There's not one thing you've hidden from the Lord. You might, got, you might have got really good hiding it from other people in your life, even those you're living in the same household from. God's not like, he's not a fool. He sees it. He knows it. He, he, he knows our thoughts. Like God is, he's, he has access to it all. So, so to try and have a degree of facade in your personal rela relationship with Jesus is counterproductive, counterintuitive on all fronts. We've got to be real. We've got to own it. God, I, gotta, I gotta accept and acknowledge where I'm really at right now in this moment, how I'm wrestling, how I'm struggling. That's where it all starts. How do you have a fresh encounter with Jesus? It's that moment of going like, I'm, I gotta own, I'm not healthy. I gotta own, I'm not doing it, I'm struggling here. Man, and I, that, that's, that's where it all starts. No more pretending, no more ignoring, no more justifying. Be real. What would it take for you to be real? When was the last time you were real with the Lord? 
Be real. Second ingredient for a fresh encounter. This one hurts. Be humble. Pride is probably the greatest obstacle to you experiencing more of God in your life. Pride. The scripture said that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. See, God, is, God has a, he, he, is, he is not about pride. It is, it is like, you, wanna, you want a recipe for like the absence of the presence of God in a moment or the activity of a God in a moment? Like God is, God is, God is not about pride, but yet we, uh, we have a lot of it. It's really difficult to swallow. It's really difficult to, to uh, get rid of in our life. I'm telling you, if you want a fresh encounter with Jesus, humble yourself. Humble, humble yourself and acknowledge that, man, I, I, I may have to, I may have to, to, to think differently about the reality of what I'm walking through right now. But if you want to experience Jesus in a fresh way, it's a, it's a genuine acknowledgement of just like, I, I've got to humble myself before the Lord. And a lot of us, um, it, does, it takes like big life circumstances to, to make us to humble us, but like, don't wait for that. Don't wait for a, a big life circumstances to come by. Bring, bring yourself before the Lord. Humble yourself before the Lord. Let God do something in you. Be real, be humble. And as those moments begin to cultivate and stir in you, thirdly, fresh encounter, how do we have one? Be repentant. This is like, this is the, I feels like the lost art of Christian practice, the art and the act of confession, of repentance, of, of taking something that you've been real, you're humbling yourself, God is speaking to you, he's stirring something, he's convicting your heart, and then doing something about that, and not just letting it sit there and walking out of it, okay, it feels good, God's convicted me, it stings a little bit, all right, humble myself, God, thank you for your forgiveness in my life. Okay, I'm going to just move forward and try to like, not let anybody else know because I can get healthy from here. No, I'm telling you, we've got to be repentant. We've got to repent. We've got to repent. What is repent? It's turning. It's shifting. It's going a complete opposite direction from where we were headed back to the feet of Jesus and going, God, I'm desperate for you. God, I need a collision with your grace. God, I turn from my sin and I, I acknowledge I can't do this on my own and I need you and I repent and I ask for forgiveness and I confess with my mouth, not just in my head, not just in my heart. Nobody can hear my mess. I confess it to you and to others. Some of you that have been bound in lust are bound in addiction to pornography, are bound to your flesh, are still bound because you have not practiced the consistent act of confession. And now, confession has gone to the extreme of just a traditional experience. We see that in the, in the, in the Catholic faith. faith there's, a, there's like, I just got to confess it to just get it out, and then I'm good and clear to go, and I don't have any other heart work to do with Jesus. I'm not talking about that, but, but we have lost sight of the power of confessing and repenting. And if you want to see the grip of the enemy loosen on your life, confess. Pastor Bird says it. He says it all the time, and it feels like every other preacher that ever preaches up here says it. What lives in the dark dies in the light. When you confess with your mouth, you expose, this is what's going on inside of me, not only to the Lord, but to men and women in your life that you can trust, that can walk with you. As soon as you confess, it's like the grip of the enemy on that specific area just begins to be pulled up because he can't, he can't hang on to something. When you confess, it gives light into a dark place. And so many of us are, we've been freed before, but we're still living bound because we have become numb to, resistant to confession. Turn towards Jesus and receive his grace. Confess. Repent. And I'm telling you, there's, there are, I'll give you my own life. This maybe, man, I've wrestled with, I've, I've wrestled with lust and pornography for years. And it's awkward as a pastor to say that, right? But like, as I prepared for the message and I prayed, the Lord was like, I mean, it's not about you. <laughs> anyway, I'm standing, I'm standing today walking in freedom that I didn't even think was possible. I didn't think it was possible. I'm telling you, I'm being honest with you. I did not think freedom, actual freedom was possible. It is. I'm walking in it, and it's amazing. But it, it did not happen until this moment of confessing. 
so many of us believe the lie, we can do this thing by ourselves, on our own, because the cost of what it would take to confess would be too great. It's not too great. God's grace abounds. God's grace is bigger. God's power is bigger. His love is bigger. His mercy is bigger than any deep, dark place that you find yourself bound in today. We got to be repentant. Be real. Be humble. Be repentant. And when you confess, man, let the grace of God just wash over you. Because see, the enemy tries to keep you. Yeah, you've messed up too long. You've been stuck too long. How? No way. One, you think one church service, you could just walk out of here, Scott, free? Like, no, you know, you're not going to, that's, that's not going to happen with you. You've been in this thing too long. False. I'm telling you what, Jesus can deliver today. Jesus can free today. Jesus can forgive in full today. Because you know what? He paid in full on the cross. It wasn't a partial payment. It wasn't a pay me back over the time. No, it was a full payment, paid in full. He has freedom for some of you today. Don't believe the lie. Receive the grace. Don't let the shame and condemnation over, overwhelm you because there is none of that in Christ Jesus. He's the only one that can transform a human heart. And he can still transform your heart and your desires and your longings today. So that's how to get free. Fresh ingredients for an encounter with Jesus. You got to It's an encounter with Jesus. And I'm, we're going to give an opportunity today to, to have moments like that with the Lord. But, but it's honestly, it's not just like a just in, contained in a church service thing. Like, I'm not going to try to package this thing all together in the 40 minutes we had all together today to just be like, here it is. Have the moment. Walk out of here. I believe you can. I believe you will. But for some of you, it's going to be taking this and letting God speak and stir and, and marinate it more. So here's some practical ways to protect your heart from lust. Again, protect your heart from fill in the blank. Practical ways today to protect your heart from lust. First one is this. Fight for your fill up. What are you talking about? You got to be filled up with God stuff. Like, like God stuff, like good God stuff, like every single day. Like when it comes to the things of the Lord, when it comes to the scriptures, like Time with God, time in the word, time in prayer, time in worship. You got to fight for it. Fight for your fill up. So many of us are co concentrating on just stop, stopping doing the bad thing. And it continues to produce the same results in our life. What, what, what we got to begin to reorient our, our thinking around our perspective of on spending less time trying to not do the wrong thing and more time doing the right thing in the Lord. And as you are doing the right thing, you're filling yourself up with the things of God. Your appetite for the things of the flesh begin to wane. But, but see, we're like, ah, I'm just not going to look at this. I'm not going to do this. I'm like, without, 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 without. No, go the other way. Go the other direction. No, okay, that's still there, those, those, those habits, those behaviors. But you know what? I'm going to fill myself with the word. I'm going to fill myself in God's presence. I'm going to wake up, and even if it's for five minutes, I'm going to open the scriptures and read a chapter, pray the Spirit speaks to me, give them some moments to, to, to give me my, the direction for the day, and then I'm going to start walking. You fill yourself up with the things of God. And you've got to fight for that fill up. Let me tell you, a lot of us are fighting a lot of things in this life. There's a lot of things that are getting us all passionate and fired up and everything going on in the world around us. So, so I know y'all are capable of fighting. That's not a question. I've seen it on Facebook. I see what you're capable of. If you're going to fight for something in this life, fight for your fill up. Fight for your fill up every single day because you know what it'll, it'll impact? It'll impact your marriage. It'll impact how you love your kids and lead your kids. It'll impact your workplace. It'll impact the, the future that you have for your life. Fight for your fill up because the world is going to demand your time, attention, distraction. It's not, a, it's not a lackadaisical thing or an apathetic thing filling yourself up with God. You got to fight for it. So how, how do you protect your heart from lust? Fight for your fill up. Ephesians 5.18 says, don't get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but rather be filled with the Spirit. Galatians 5.16 says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you won't gratify the desires of your flesh. Fill with the Spirit. Fill with the Word. Fill with prayer. Fill with worship. Build with God. We okay so far? Yeah. Two more. 
Practical ways to protect your heart from lust. You ready? Kill what you got to kill. So many of us, again, we think we're stronger than we are in some of these areas. And so if, if, if let's just be real practical about, about maybe lust or pornography for a moment. If there's a space in your house or there's a device in your hand that is the location or the source that, that is, makes it easier for you to walk into that place of sin, kill it. What are we playing games for? I know why we're playing games. It's because it's not convenient. And because it's, it's a comfort we've become used to and accustomed to. And again, we try to think to ourselves, it, we can justify our way around. I'm telling you, you, you've got to kill what you've got to kill. Once you fight for your fill-up, then you kill what you've got to kill. Cut the cord. Pull the plug. One more alliteration. Smash the source. <laughs> like, like don't, don't play games. And this is, again, this is a real practical one. But if there's a source in your life, That's making it easier for you to indulge in your flesh that you know, even if it's not permanently, but it's temporarily, you you need to kill what you got to kill. Sorry, I just woke up that baby if I caught the door. (laughs) Kill what you got to kill. Colossians, listen, this is is where I get my merit for what I'm saying. This is where you're like, wow, that's really intense. That seems like it might be a lot. Yeah, it is. But listen what Paul Paul says this in Colossians chapter 3. Put to death, therefore. Whatever is earthly in you, sexual morality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Put to death. Okay? One. Galatians 5.24. He says this again, Paul. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and with its passions and desires. Romans 8.13. Paul again. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Paul was explicit. Don't play games. Wherever those little fires are that could turn into forest fires in your, in your house, kill it, crush it, eliminate it, and, 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 and help yourself win with the Lord there. We got to put to death. Some of us are going way too easy on, on the sources of our flesh being indulged in our life. If it's Facebook, get off Facebook. If it's these little portals that you leave open because it's, it's, it's convenient, I'm telling you, you're... The way Jesus described it in Matthew chapter 5, if your eye causes you to sin, if your hand causes you to sin, gouge it out, cut it off. What is he saying? Not actually c- cut your eye out in your hand. He's, but he's par- I mean, just like he's showing you the contrast of how serious he is about like, don't keep playing with this because it will kill you. It's better for you to walk into heaven with one eye and one hand than to, than to go to hell with a full body. It's, it's, it's going to be better for some of you to have a house that doesn't have compu- a, a laptop in it that you can have access to than it is for you to continue to stay bound in your own home in an addiction to pornography because that's what's convenient. I'm telling you, you got to kill what you got to kill. And that's going to take some guts. But following Jesus was never meant to be easy peasy lemon squeezy. <laughs> Fight for your fill up. Kill what you got to kill. <laughs> Finally, how do you stay free? You pursue the right help. You know, this kind of comes back to the, the humbling yourself part from a little bit ago. Because a lot of us, we really do believe this thing. We can do this by ourselves. I've, I've talked to so many men who, like, their, their wives have no clue. Their pastors have no clue. Their, their life group has no clue. Women as well. I know. My wife has talked to women as we've been in ministry. They just have no clue because this isn't just a men thing. This is a women thing too. They just have no idea because they're, they've isolated themselves to live in this, in this space. They're like, I can do this on my own. And then they, they, they experience some victory and then they fall again and they've just been in this cycle for years. And God's like, that's not, I'm God, that's, not, that's not what I died for. And there's no shame or condemnation, but there's more for you. Pursue the right help. Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. You cannot do this thing alone. Some of you need to process conversations that you need to have with the right people leaving the service today. Gutsy conversations. Again, I see I'm, I'm, I'm like micro-processing as I'm talking. It's like a, I don't know what's happening, but it's like a... 
I, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking if I'm you, okay, this is all, this is, this is difficult. Like, this is awkward and uncomfortable. This isn't the 4th of July message. <laughs> that, that, that you know, but, but maybe it really is because God really is, he really has a freedom for you that's beyond what you can fathom or imagine. And some, are, some of us have settled for a, a bound Christianity when God has died for a free Christianity, a freedom to experience in Christ. That we're just, we're, we're experiencing half of it. And then it's exhausting because you're trying to just, you're trying to, it's just exhausting. I mean, you, no wonder you, your, your mission effectiveness is low. Like you don't even have the capacity emotionally to like go be a light in the world. It's because you're still wrestling in your own darkness. And God's like, yo, I got more for you. But we need, we need men and women on mission. We need men and women making disciples who make disciples because there's a, there's a lost and broken world that's desperate for Jesus that doesn't know all of this stuff yet, has no encounter with Jesus yet, and you're going to be a part of that exchange. But if, if we're still sitting around and trying to handle our own stuff by ourselves and staying bound, we're missing it. So this isn't even just about you. This isn't even just about your family and your marriage or your future family and your future marriage. This is about the people God's called you to reach with the gospel. Pursue the right help. I'm going to invite the band up here as I, as I wrap up. There's some resources, like real practically. I didn't want to just have a, a heart message without some really practical things, because some of you are listening to this, and you're like, no, I, I need to take a next step for sure, because, man, I've been, this was the day God, like, was like, yep, I have, I have more for you, and you, you know God's already speaking and stirring, um, and so I got some resources. I'm going to throw them up on the screen. Just real quick, just a simple one. I think they'll be on the screen. Yep, maybe. Cool, cool, okay. A couple of them, I'm gonna roll through them and then we're gonna conclude. If you just need extra help, there's, there's four resources I wanna talk about tonight, today. Uh, the first one is Covenant Eyes. It's an online accountability and filtering platform for your devices. Something you can't live without your device. It's part of work, it's part of communication. You don't even have a house phone anymore, right? How many of you have a house phone still, anybody? Nice, come on. I don't. I haven't had one for like 10 years. I haven't had one since I moved out of my parents' house. That's how, that's how long I haven't had <laughs> So you can't, you can't operate without the technology. And part of the problem is that the technology is, is the greatest source of your struggle. Uh, so there's a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of help out there. Covenant Eyes is a great, is a great um, filtering program, that accountability program that you can set up to help you in that fight and in that, in that struggle. It's, a, it's also got a ton of, uh, a ton of resources in, in that pro, uh, platform as well. Another one. Fight the New Drug, www.fightthenewdrug.org. Incredible organization that's doing a lot of work to help with the sex trafficking industry and how pornography impacts that, and it's a great resource and help for you as you're processing how to break some of these cycles and get more, uh, more freedom in that space. Uh, another one, two more. Another one, John Bevere's video series called Porn Free um, is fantastic, and uh, it's, it's not free, but it's worth it. It's available at... Um, moralrevolution.com slash porn free. Incredible, incredible video, video series. He gets right to it, right to his struggle with pornography, the years of addiction that he had, the shame that he felt and experienced that he was, wasn't able to walk in the light for years and, and then God broke through. Um, and then finally, uh, there's, there's something called the Men's Conquer series. You might've been seeing it on social media for the last couple weeks. Uh, for men, Specifically, it just started this last week. So if you're like, I need something in person, I need something face to face with with some other guys that are walking through it, this is an incredible opportunity. You've only missed the first session, so it's not too late. Um, you get get the right help, pursue the right help. This is a great opportunity. So if you want more information about men's conquer series that just started, it's a 10-week thing. You can go to livingwater.com slash men and get more information. I think you can still sign up there. Uh, and if you can't, if the link is broken for some reason, and I'm saying this and it's not there, email me and I will help get you set up. Chase at livingwater.com. I'm passionate about this, man. I want men and women to be free. Stay free. So today, for those struggling, his kindness leads us to repentance. God's not like, one more time, I'm going to smash you. No, his, his kindness is what leads us to repentance. It's not shame. It's not making us feel bad about ourselves. It's not you know better, you knew better. No, it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. His grace is for you. Yes, 
even you today. And none of this is possible without Jesus. And he, as Jesus walks through the Sermon on the Mount in chapter five, and he says, you've heard it said, but I say, he does a lot of these little things. You're like, how is that even possible? Everybody's looked at a woman at one point with lustful intent. And so you're saying we've all committed adultery. And like, so we all like, like we're, how is that even possible to not do that? Jesus is like, yeah, well, the point is you can't do it without me. The point is like, I'm the fulfillment of the law. The point is you are, you're, you're, you're sitting a duck. What's the term? A sitting duck. I'm dead in the water. That's what I was trying, trying to combine, <laughs> combine metaphors. You can't, you can't do it without me. This battle, you can't fight on your own. You got to humble yourself. This is a battle you've got to fight from your knees. You got to have hands lifted high. Humble yourself before me and know that I'm the one that's won the battle. I'm the only one that can live the perf perfect life and did and died and rose again so you could experience that resurrection power and new identity in your life. So if you're sitting here today overwhelmed by how much you have to overcome or to get out of, take heart. That's available for you today. Some of you need a fresh collision with Jesus today. A moment of him beginning a new work in your heart, transforming it. I'm going to pray for you. Remember David. Remember David, King David. Adulterer and then murderer, and yet somehow he was known as a man after God's own heart. How? Well, he humbled himself and he repented. And he humbled himself and he repented. And he humbled himself and he repented. He wasn't perfect by a far long stretch, but he humbled himself and he repented. And he humbled himself and he repented. And then he humbled himself and he repented. And as he continued to do that, his desire for the things of God outweighed his desire for the things of his flesh. I'm telling you, that can be you today. The battle belongs to Jesus. For those of you in here that aren't struggling, and you're sitting here going like, this is not my thing at all. You probably know somebody who is. And if you don't, you do, but you don't know. Let this be a day that you remember the freedom that you have because of Jesus. And praise him for it. As we sing in just a moment here, praise him for the freedom that you've experienced. Praise God for the freedom that you've experienced. Also, I challenge you to shift the way that you think about this whole issue that we talked about today. Don't let it be taboo. Don't let it be a space or a place that you're like, holding and reserving judgment for somebody who's walking through it. No, ask God to give you new eyes to see this, to give you new eyes to see how he wants to work in people's lives in and through you that are struggling and wrestling. Fresh vision, powered by the spirit. And then finally, be empowered and prepared to help somebody walk through it. Listen, this, this, none of this all works if the people that are wrestling and struggling walk out of here and don't have anybody else that's not struggling to walk this out with. They got to have other people that have overcome and should, can walk with you and say, hey, I, I still love you. I still see you. You're not a dirty mess that I can't be around. No, I see God's grace all over you. Let's walk this thing out together. And when you fall again, I'll be right there to help you back up to keep walking with the Lord and this thing together. Some spouses need to be ready for that kind of conversation. Some life group guys and gals, and you need to be ready. Some of you guys that have been in relationship, I mean, this, is, this isn't here, but this is, this is something that I believe can transform somebody that's struggling and on the brink of like merit, I mean, divorce or something else. Some of you men in here have relationships with men in your life that you are the one that God wants to use to ask the right questions and, and be lovingly in, in investigative, not accusatory, but investigative because you, you've allowed your friendships to be surface level. It's all about the game. It's all about the, the latest political thing that you're all mad about, whatever else. But listen, you, you, God's calling you to call somebody up or the next time you're all together, you're playing golf, having a great time. Don't miss the opportunity to be used by the spirit of God to go, hey, I know we haven't talked about this in a long time. Man. I'm, I'm, I'm not even fully there, but man, I, God's putting it on my heart like, how are you doing in this space? Are you struggling? Are you wrestling? Are you struggling? Like, how's your, how is your heart? Because I care about you. I love you. And no matter what you say, I'm not going to leave, but I want to see you healthy. I want to see you walk. I mean, or, Ready? You, hey, I know we don't talk about this often, but man, I just, God's been doing something to me. Can I be honest with you? I've been struggling. And I want to be open with you because I know I can't do this alone. I know we, I know we don't talk about this. I mean, it's pretty surface and it's pretty like, 
all about work, all about whatever. But I feel like I don't want to just keep having friendships that just roll around on the surface. I want authentic relationships that go deep. I want I want an iron sharpen iron kind of relationship here. I want to be I want to be more like Christ, and so I'm going to humble myself and invite you into this space. Man, we need some of those conversations. God's God's ready. So I'm gonna pray for you. And I'm gonna invite you to stand and we're gonna sing this chorus and bridge together and give the Lord a moment, wherever you are this morning, to stir and to speak. Maybe seal some things up. And then we probably, some of us have some work to do and that's okay, praise God. Praise God for that. Praise God he doesn't leave us in our sin. Praise God Jesus came and he died, rose again so that we could experience freedom and new life. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your grace. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for Jesus. Will you stand to your feet this morning as I continue to pray and we can get ready to worship? God, thank you for your your unending love and mercy, God, that's on display through Christ Jesus. God, that we can't do it without you. And you love us regardless. There's no shame or condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. I pray for freedom today. God, I pray for freedom. I pray for a fresh moment with your spirit. That, that it causes us to remember we can't do it on our own. We humble ourselves. This battle is yours. So God, help us. Help us experience the victory that you paid for in a new and a fresh way. God, do it in your name. Do it in me. Do it in us. Do it in this place. In Jesus' name. Let's sing this chorus out a few times together and give the Spirit some opportunity to speak, some opportunity.
there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus this morning. Don't walk out of here condemned. Don't walk out of here ashamed. Listen, God loves you. He sees you, and he is more powerful than your sin. The battle belongs to him. So walk out of here free. Walk out of here empowered. Walk out of here ready to have some conversations by the Spirit. His grace is going to flow into those places. And we're going to see God do something in our lives, in your lives, in this church's lives like never before. Because we're free from the inside out because of the cross. In Jesus' name. Hey, if you want prayer this morning, if you're like, ah, this is something that's starting to me. We've got some pastors down here. We'd love to pray for you. Uh, make sure you do something with those next steps. You, only you and the Lord can know what you really need to do next. But don't leave it here. Don't leave it here in Jesus' name. And then July 18th, man, make, make plans to join us for the family barbecue out there. It's going to be a lot, of, a lot of fun. We love you. We love you. We love you. Have a great 4th of July.